there we go. I, you will notice that I'm going to talk about phones, uh, mobile computers. Um, I'll be really approaching this uh, through a very what's called you know like device or platform agnostic um, uh, through a, a platform agnostic lens, which means you know today the way we uh, support language teaching and learning with technology can be done the same way with our larger computers, um, uh, desktops, laptops, um, you know, portables, as well as even our iWatches and things like that. It does not matter all that much uh, what it is that we use. Similar ideas apply. Technology is always secondary in a sense that first you decide what it is that you want to uh, teach and then you really uh, or to do in generally speaking and then you look for the right tool uh, however you always have to bear in mind what tools are available um, to you know to your target audience that's what it is so it's a bit of a you know um, iteration, decision-making iteration, right? Um, so this is what we are looking at today and tonight, that is. So the first question um, is pretty important for me, uh, you know, to in order to be able to understand who I'm talking to. Um, I'm asking you to now, is there a chat box? Again, I'm back to the screen for a second. Yes, there is. Yes, so I see it right now, but you know what's happening is I don't see it when I'm presenting. So that's pretty unfortunate, but there is it's happened to me multiple times before. I know what to do. Nina will get busy now <laughs> if I may. Oh, so that's okay. I, that's okay. Mm -hmm. I used to are you looking at my PowerPoint right now? No. Yes, it's you it says audience poll. So I assume you want us to type uh, the answer. Okay, very good. So you are looking. Now I figured out how it works. All right, mm -hmm. so that means that I can still read the box. So what is it that you're using? And I'm reading currently in the chat box your answers. Um, very good. And it's when I ask what you're using, sorry, I wasn't specific enough, not for teaching. What platform? Because that makes a bit of a difference to some extent. Are you an Android user, an iPhone user, or um, you don't really use mobile phones? Okay, I got it. You know what, it's pretty much, it's pretty much 3070 for going Android. Okay, I, I, got, I got a good idea. There's another question that you, uh, you've answered to, some of you have already answered. Have you ever used smartphone in your teaching? And I see some of you nodding your head, both, Isa, no, no, yes, yes. Um, I'm kind of calculating in my head what, what I have in the audience here and how to, and recalibrating everything, you know, how that works. Oh, I have 50-50. All right. And I see Nina Constantinos there, so she knew, she knows what I was talking about when we said Palala. Okay. <laughs> Good, thank you for that. And um, what heritage language and what age group are you currently teaching? And there's a picture from Warsaw, I had to do that. I took it myself last time I was visiting my parents. Oh, there's another Polish, yay. I mean, no bias there. <laughs> All right, um, adults, I see. So we, again, children three four five wow lots of children you must have really appreciated my comment that i haven't really worked all that much with children have I? <laughs> <laughs> um old age groups okay good i think i know where i am more or less oh 316 wow everybody basically everybody all languages wow nice <laughs> um good Oh, just for you to have a bit of more understanding, I've done work in different languages and very much interdisciplinary. You already know that. I've written two, uh, co uh, sorry, co edited and edited two books on language learning. One is mobile assisted language learning, and one is blended language learning that I 
didn't actually add to uh, this, forgot to add here. Um, I uh, put a few pictures in here because they uh, matter a lot to me. And a very important one is in the upper right corner where this gentleman in Ghana, when I was um, teaching um, mobile learning design to these, um, to this group of instructional designers, um, Towards the end of one of the classes, he actually got up and started dancing. And it was a very memorable moment for me. And this picture has uh, come back um, uh, to remind me how beautiful my job is over and over again. And it's here with me during this presentation because he started dancing, others join him. And I'm what I, you know, a little bit puzzle, ask him what he was doing, he says, it's a dance of gratitude. Um, gratitude to all our teachers and to you for what you just taught me, now I can serve others. And that's how I feel even here today, right? It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer all the questions that I can answer for you so you can go continue um, teaching and serve others. That is very important. Now, um, when I said, um, mobile assisted language learning very often referred to also as mobile language learning. What's important about mobile language learning is the mobile part. There's a lot of discussion in literature about uh, what mobile is. For me, it's the mobile student. But today, under the COVID circumstances, the student is not as mobile as student used to be and will be again. Uh, hopefully pretty much. Uh, when we have all that, you know, we have lesser restrictions in the mobility of the student, a lot of the mobile assisted language learning, heritage language or any other language is actually done in the communities in where the language is spoken with people around where the mobile device is then used really to moderate the, 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 the whole learning process. Um, <clears throat> It's uh, very important, um, and I'm going to look at your faces, but you still see my, um, my slides. Good. <laughs> um, yes, we do. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, it's, yeah, it's very important to understand that mobility of a learner, right? Suddenly, you don't have to be in the classroom. You can take all the various supports with you into wherever you are applying the language. Or uh, you can use those um, mobile devices uh, you know, for the uh, to gather artifacts and gather pieces of information that later on you can actually, <clears throat> excuse me, use to create further artifacts and co-create with others in the process of learning. It, it'll get, don't worry, it'll get very practical. <laughs> but I am an academic, so I have to go through this little piece. Um, okay, so very important in this environment is, again, to remember that mobile assisted language learning or mobile uh, language learning is mostly about pedagogy. That is enabled by technology. But if you don't understand how the technology can be used, then your pedagogy also gets somewhat limited. Uh, you don't allow yourself to be as creative in your pedagogical uh, approaches, right? So, so sometimes even just self-efficacy, not believing in the fact that you can use the tools, not feeling uh, ready to use digital tools, can limit you in your creativity, in your pedagogy, and in your approach towards um, teaching and learning, obviously, right? Um, what those tools give you is computing capabilities that you can put in your pocket, right? Uh, all kinds of multimedia tools, access to experts on the go. So, you know, you can pull up any YouTube video, whatever, wherever, almost wherever you are. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, you can communicate through them as phones are created for um, through multimedia again. But while you're doing all of that, you have to constantly ask yourself, is the student ready? What is good for the student? Is this the right context for the student to be doing what I ask them to do? It has to be like any design, very purposeful, very intentional in its design, right? So you know, as language teachers, um, that, and 
many of you are probably language learners as well, that um, language is best taught, gosh, some people would not agree with me, but um, when it's really taught as integrated skill. Now, it's important to be teaching all the various language skills, but you cannot be teaching them all the time in separation. Even if you have to focus on, let's say, listening, speaking, grammar, if any, you know, for people who believe in teaching grammar in isolation, if you're teaching these skills or practicing these skills in isolation, you have to then definitely put them all together and um, make them into usable language, right? Uh, all that input that you're putting in, you have to create activities for the students to actually create output if you want this behavioral language, um, uh, behaviorist language, sorry. And, uh, and you know, they have to be practiced. Now, um, it's amazing with uh, what's happening with our access to, um, you know, artifacts in various languages. Although I really love the real life um, authentic language activities, um, you know, still doing these activities and try, I mean, practicing them um, online is a great option. We'll get to that, okay? You can um, online collaborate, connect, and you can also be, you know, engage in very active and meaningful um, activities. It's very important to use these tools to empower students. And, uh, and really this is um, where I'm going to stop on this. Uh -huh. A little bit more about um, model learning. Now this is already from 2013. And this slide here is only to remind us um, what direction is generally learning taking when there is a little bit more um, focus in pedagogy, whatever it is that you're teaching, including languages, right? A little bit more focus on self-directed learn, uh, learning, even for children, right? Learning based on uh, um, inquiry. And uh, a lot of what's happening is social learning. And nowadays, I don't know if any of you are practitioners of social emotional learning, but if you're not, this is something uh, that's definitely worth looking into, social emotional learning. Um, uh, well, that's a whole different uh, subject, but um, if you're interested, look into SEL. So look at what's happening, what the principles of these three approaches here are. Compiling, contributing, combining, changing things. For me, it's like, you know, just, just really um, generating uh, based on the existing, right? Then correlating, comparing, catching, cooperating, connecting, communicating, collaborating, and learning collectively. So um, all these Cs, um, there is a reason for that. And um, there you go. What are we doing a lot in language learning, and which is important, I already mentioned, you know, um, the need for road learning as well in, in language learning. Um, but a lot of it is really what you have listed here. Um, the behaviorist, more behaviorist uh, learning where you are learning by repeating, re-listening, replaying, recording, rehearsing, memorizing, uh, redoing, and then, uh, you know, this is all very important, don't take me wrong. It's very important, you need time for this, you need uh, energy for this, and tools for that too. Once this is done, I encourage all of you, oh, reflecting is actually, uh, should be in a different group, but hey, <laughs> I'm glad it's there. Um, and then when, you, when you've done, you've gone through that phase of getting your basics, um, road memorization, understanding uh, the structures. It's really time to, as I say, integrate everything and start uh, communicating, collaborating, connecting, and doing it with others. A lot of what I'm going to be uh, showing here today, the tools are really uh, meant to allow just that, the co-learning, right? 
co-generating, co-constructing, doing things together, because it's all based on communication and communication is what we are teaching. We're teaching a, you know, language um, of communication, a symbol of connecting with others and um, uh, communicating with them. You notice that here, um, in terms of constructing and contextualizing, I um, put those two in italics because it has a little bit different, um, well, we have to, I guess, hmm, focus on a little bit different approaches right now under COVID and uh, a lot of that con constructing and contextualizing will be happening on the web through the phones, not necessarily by people meeting together. Now, I don't know, and that's a question I forgot to ask you, and I just put my, uh, back, my camera back on so I can look at you, not my camera, but your camera back on so I can look at you. Can you show me, but the show of hands, who is actually still meeting with students and teaching students in person? Is everything okay? So you're still doing that. Okay. All right. I see. Good. I mean, good. Um, it's a great opportunity to be contextualizing things. Okay. Wow. And then after you've co-created, hmm, um, you have to share. And now we're going to start talking about tools. First of all, how can you share? I'm sure you're all doing some of it, if not all of it. Um, I just threw in a couple of examples of uh, how I share what I will propose to you. You should be cre creating or your students should be creating and co-creating. I would share by what we're doing here tonight, where students, um, be it in Zoom, in any other uh, meeting platform, right? Where students are actually um, displaying their artifacts, which could be uh, stories, individual stories, which could be uh, group stories, which could be poetry, which could be, I've had movies, I've had interviews done in, in Zoom, um, all kinds of things I've created with students, radio um, in Zoom, right? Um, we've collected, we've collected pictures of students um, involved in different activities, pictures of everything Polish, pictures of Greek food, right? You know, you've done all these things. Uh, we've collected those in Google Drive in what, you know, the slide, uh, the PowerPoint, if you wish, of Google Drive there and created a walk through the different um, uh, pictures and then discussion around them. We've used Instagram to share our pictures and I'm just showing this picture of Instagram here uh, to, to remind you that in Instagram d does come in various languages. So that's of importance, right? Um, and you can comment on things in different languages there as well. Um, you can invite students to um, create and um, share through web quests. And this is just one site that speaks a little, in a little bit more detail about um, how to go about creating web quests because not everybody knows. And this is time for me to actually stop and ask you, have you ever done any web quests? Do you know what I mean? I see some people. Okay, Trudy, <coughs> your turn. <laughs> um, so, so do you want to share with us an example of a web quest or do you want me to do that? Um, well, what I did for a web quest is in my university class, I had students go and look up all of the different professional organizations that they should join, ELA being one of them, and just do things like check, like check out ELA, Casalt, other organizations, how much does it cost for membership, what is some professional opportunity that happens through that, just so that they become familiar with all of those different organizations without me telling them, making them just kind of go search through the information. I don't know if that's the proper web quest that you're suggesting, but that's what I did. 
Absolutely. Any, uh, this is a very good example. Uh, WebQuest can be uh, of so many different types. So I just threw it to you, you know, when you speak Greek, you speak food, right? Um, so I, I have done with a cohort of Greek students, I've done WebQuest when I ask them to be actually collecting just pictures and recipes of different Greek foods, everything in Greek, right? And then I'm putting them together into, again, it really depends where you want it to be. But in this case, we were putting it into uh, Google Docs. Google Doc is a document that everybody can share and we can uh, at the same time be working on it and discussing it. So what I do a lot of, very successfully is a very simple approach when I don't see people in, um, in person, is I first invite people to go through WebQuest. So they do their, it's like this flipped classroom idea. So they do their homework, they collect their, whatever I ask them to collect. Then they put it all in a Google Doc that's shareable, Everybody can, you know, be looking at this Google Doc while we are in Zoom, right? We believe it or not, we've been using Zoom more than any other tools for meetings. Again, if you have questions about that, I can answer them, but that's what's been for us a winner. So in Zoom, we would be sitting in Zoom, talking, let's say, in, in Greek, right? And then at the same time, all looking at that shared document with all the pictures and all the foods, right? So that gives you a lot of various opportunities to be working in this particular uh, case. Um, well, kind of in person online, right? And be looking at the same document and typing things, questions, pulling out words, uh, explaining words to each other, teaching each other how to, you know, um, and tell stories about how the you know, your grandmother did, uh, I don't know, hummus or whatever it is, right? So um, this kind of thing. So that's just one example. Um, and then when I gave you this bigger picture, now I'm going into more details. So every single phone includes a uh, smartphone, smartphone, right? Uh, has all these tools. You don't don't really need apps or anything else you can just use these tools right you can use the audio and video players um, and your mic and your phone to you and your students that is right uh, to record right uh, to record podcasts for example so I was teaching English for special purposes um, to a group of accountants and myself, not an accountant, right? Um, I needed to understand a few concepts, notions a little bit better. So they created a podcast. Now, these were students, not little children, right? Uh, these were students um, 21 to 30 years old. And uh, basically what they did, they created a using their phones only and interviewing people they created podcasts in whatever language you need to, it to be about notions in um, accounting that I asked them to explain to me. Then you, obviously I could listen to that at any time. Now, this is an amazing activity. I wonder if you've ever invited your students to create any podcasts. And it's very simple because actually the phone has an app for podcasting. And I'm looking at your yes, no. I'm. I have a few faces on the screen. I confess, I've never oh. done it. <laughs> well, very good, good. So I have something to offer here. Okay. <laughs> yes, please. Um, <laughs> Um, so with podcasting, because you've never used these tools, there are podcasting tools, right? Like you can download a free podcasting tool, and. Uh, I'm just signaling for you, like, listen, go into your app store and type in podcast builder, right? And see what's available for free. Don't pay for anything. You know that. Um, okay. If you don't want to do this, you can use many tools already existing on your phone to record a message and, uh, and just put it again, a link to it in a doc 
in a Google Doc, let's say again, Google Doc, where students can be looking at it together and listening to it. But that's a bit of a not too advanced approach to that. How about that? There are better ways and we'll get to those too. Then you can use YouTube. YouTube is so powerful uh, for everything, for students, you know, to watch movies in the language you want them to be watching movies in. They can put captioning on in whatever, you know, language you want. Uh, this captioning, you know how it works. <laughs> sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I made it into an activity. We already, Trudy and I kind of exchanged our comments about it today. I made it into an activity for students. Go listen to this podcast, look at the captions, discuss how good the captions, how well the captions were done right this is a really good very you know like it really um requires the students to be doing critical thinking critical work right so and that was really lots of fun to be doing that with them also youtube can be used for them to be recording youtube has a whole uh like video manager very simple to use so if you open it your personal youtube channel right account sorry if you don't have one yet you have a whole like manager there where you can record videos and audio only as well you can do with them whatever you want so you can put words in there you can put like word bubbles in there whatever the tools are very self-explanatory yeah you know you have to spend a, a couple of hours first to figure it out and then you can you know keep all these videos, audios, your students, yours, and everybody else's uh, that you want to in a private channel that is private and secure and nobody but you can have access to. Now, this is internet. I am not going to promise you 100% security because I don't believe in 100% security, okay? But it is your private channel and that should be enough right and nobody who you know is not invited can access it so in youtube for example i don't know if you realize that but you, you can post things publicly you can post things as unlisted right so then people can find them only with the url um with the link right and then you can post things uh totally privately as well right so if you just after tonight use youtube you're done you don't need anything else seriously youtube can like i should have just a whole class here class or session on youtube right but i know that you can go home and you can do that yourself you can look into youtube and see how that works for you okay so your voice recorder on your phone uh now by the way have you ever used it for anything your voice recorder on your phone yes some people have okay so what i do sometimes don't laugh i forgot how to oh no it's i'm going to say it it's and it's recorded there are words i don't remember how to spell in polish i know it's horrible okay uh i'm a linguist <laughs> and i don't know how to spell some of the polish words well you know how i cheat you know how i cheat i take my phone <laughs> I turn Polish on and I record these things in Polish and this phone is smarter than me. It spells it properly, right? So basically uh, you can do it in a, you know, in notes, right? The, the, in notes, you can do it in when I'm sending messages me in, in Messenger, when I'm sending messages on Facebook, whatever. All you have to do is switch the language to Polish, say it in Polish and it's spelled properly. End of story, right? So that's a bit of a cheat, but it's also a great opportunity for language learning, right? Okay, so don't forget that you have the you know video recording and um, and camera uh, on your phone and on your computer and on your laptop, and just creative work can be done. You see stand-up comedy? Oh my gosh! Actually, I always um, I put it in there because I've done it with my students and it's just brilliant what some people do it's just just brilliant right so i've done radio i've done circus stand-up comedy and all kinds of role-playing with students okay 
So we already talked about the fact that there is speech to text and there's also text to speech on our phones, right? So that's very important. And uh, you can operate uh, nowadays almost everything via voice. You just have to try it. People don't know it. Like, you know, I see people have their smart TVs at home and they don't know that they can operate their TVs by voice. But yeah, if you bought your TV in the last two years, it has a voice option. You just have to turn it on, right? Uh, so whenever we have options of voice, there are opportunities for language learning, right? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I personally uh, do use social network tools uh, for teaching. And it depends for what and with whom. Um, we know that different, you know, when you work with children, there are three. I saw someone here saying three to six or whatever, right? I am not going to encourage, uh, you know, these kids to be using their own phones. And actually, really, I would discourage that because we know that phones, yeah. It's not been confirmed, but um, there's still a lot of research needed that we, we've seen observed had some evidence that um, leads to a conclusion that children below the age of, what is it now, um, seven really should not, be, should not be spending too much time with phones. Nobody should be, but that's a different story. I hope your phone is not in your bedroom. <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, definitely not, a, you know, a newborns that when the, the, the brain is being formed and everything, you want them away from the phone, right? So I had to throw it in. Um, but yeah, but, uh, but when it's with the help, and that's one part, I'm not really sure how it works for you, what the aim engagement of the parents and family who speak the heritage language is, because that's very important, right? But I encourage that involvement, and I'm sure you, um, you've been really, have you been working with families? Were you in, okay, that's what I've done in the Uplift project when I worked with um, adult literacy, where you would have adults who don't write or read, right? But the children do. The children had an opportunity to go to school. So we had family, you know, readings, family um, watching TV together with um, cops on, with this and that, and things done around the idea of children actually reading to adults, right? And then having a discussion around what was uh, read. And it's very empowering for the children. It's, it's, it's just amazing what I saw, right? Um, and uh, now that we spend more time with our families at home, it's really a great opportunity to be asking yourself a question. How can phones, how, how, can, uh, how can one phone, one computer, one laptop be used for a group of three people in a family to be doing heritage language activities? You know best what these activities could be. Now, oh my gosh, if you, yeah, I don't want to challenge you too much, but I'm still going to mention that. So blogs and wikis, blogs, right? When children are a little bit older and adults and young people, they know how to blog nowadays. And you can blog as a group, right? So, so that's the only reason I mentioned, for example, wix.com. It's very simple. You can go in there and create your own website and have your own blog. You can blog as a teacher. You can have all kinds of things happening in that blog. I mean, you read blogs yourselves, right? In those blogs, you can put videos. Uh, you can put... Um, uh, all kinds of multimedia artifacts and have a conversation around that. Uh, these are for free. Obviously, most of these tools have both uh, free and paid options. So consider that. That's very important. Usually, you don't need more than the free option version because, well, it depends on the tool, but most of them just cap the number of um, people in, that can access your blog or can access your recording or whatever it is, I don't think you're going to 
uh, be concerned with that. Oh, I know, I wanted to throw in here something now a little bit more organized. So this was what I created for ESL. As you can tell, they were learning um, a mobile, right? And it was a group of ESL uh, learners, all immigrants, um, learning in Toronto. So I wanted to give you an example of what, you know, those contextualized activities could look like. And that was the example that was available to me, um, an older one, but that doesn't matter. So it was all ta task-based learning that was spread over a few weeks, right? And uh, basically what they were doing, um, Sitasquan Idiom Bank was all about taking pictures that would uh, encapsulate the meaning of an idiom, right? Um, and you'll see a couple of these pictures in a minute. Then I would ask them to post it in our blog. We had like a blog going on, class blog, right? And, um, and then other students would be commenting on the picture, giving it likes, dislikes, and things like that. Then those idioms had to be used, um, had to be also explained in words, and they had to be used in a sentence as well. So then in the second task, students were creating a multimedia class, multimedia dictionary, where they were again recording audio recording words and that's why multimedia right and their pronunciation and meaning and usage of these words um sometimes in conversations as well in task three here um audio map uh, okay, so what was done here, we created as a class a map. Everybody uh, had to go to a particular point in Toronto and learn about this spot, um, then put the most important information together. I threw a map in the blog and they could send all these to me because they needed my my technology understanding of technology help right they would send all these items to me i would post them on the map and then on the map there were recordings and information about the various landmarks of toronto then we created a scavenger hunt and uh created a student's radio and also i uh sent students a lot of uh, my uh well, podcasts created by myself and found on the internet that they could listen to on the go. And then task eight, you see your reflections. Students had to record their own reflections. They had like a learning journal and um, they were sharing those with others. So this is just an example of many tasks put together um, in order to work on various um, language skills, in this case, unfortunately in ESL, but I thought I'm still going to, or fortunately, <laughs> uh, share it with you because it might give you ideas of how to uh, do that yourself. So guess what that is? I see some nodding heads. So this goes back to this task of, uh, taking a photo of an English idiom. Can you recognize the two idioms, idioms that were? <laughs> is the first one catch 22 or? Yes, it is catch 22, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is what the students were, <laughs> were doing, right? They were basically putting it up and there was a whole discussion. So they were humorous, there were all kinds. I want that wine, Lesha. <laughs> what wine are you drinking? <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> so anyway. Okay, we are. Uh, yeah, we lost. Gina said that. Gina okay, said that. Thank you. See that? Money laundry. Yeah. Laundry. Money laundering. Money laundering. Yes. That's it. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, you lost me there for a moment. I'm back, right? Okay. No. So then, now a little bit about uh, mobile apps. And as you see, they can be used for um, all kinds of things, for everything. We said that over and over again, and just moving to examples of them now. <clears throat> 
I'm going to share this PowerPoint with you and all these links are hot links. So you can just click on them and I'll take you to the website, right? Um, but uh, what mobile apps out there can be used and I've used, these are the only, only the ones that I've used. So the first one, dictionary.com is a, an English and it, it comes with all kinds of games and everything, but I, I found uh, other ones in other languages and you know your dictionaries, online dictionaries. What I wanted to emphasize here, many of those dictionary uh, sites actually do offer um, some, not many, uh, games and, and activities. I don't know if you've looked into that, but they do. D uh, Dictionary.com does. Right, so it's a very good example. Then Flashcard Machine is just one of many available apps that um, allow you to create your own or, or co-create with the group uh, flashcards for vocabulary or phrases or whatever it is, right? So you create them, I actually, I have been trying to learn Greek. So I've created them um, here, and this is like for rote memorization. I sit somewhere waiting, whatever, or from time to time, I just go through the flashcards and I see if I remember, right? Many of them do come with audio, which is wonderful. Quizlet is one of the king ones, right? So again, have you used Quizlet for anything? So I see some nods, wonderful. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, guys. I saw it. Okay. Hey, how are you? Sorry, uh, my camera is not working, but I was on the way. <laughs> I saw on the telephone. Uh, I got an email out from uh, Trudy. I said, I hope, I hope to come to see you guys. How's everything? Everything is okay with you guys? <laughs> We're all good, Syed. We're just in the middle of a presentation. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Okay, I'm listening. Okay, continue, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. Okay. These other two, Quizlet, I'm going to have another uh, slide on because it deserves it. For speaking and listening, podcasting, pronunciation, for story recording. Remember, storytelling is so important, right? For story recording, mm -hmm. voice thread, uh, SoundCloud, Audio Boom. I'm seeing now that it's too advanced for you, so you can scratch it and not bother with it because it's actually um, a professional podcasting um, platform, right? Audacity, the Audacity tool is just fabulous. It takes a little bit of time, a couple of hours to figure out what, how the tools work, but even like um, sound professionals, Use this free tool, Audacity, for recording. It's fabulous if you want to do any recording of your own stories for students or whatever it is, right? Now, audiobooks in any language, this link takes you to English, but there are audiobooks available in all kinds of languages for free. I can guarantee that in every language, right? Now, I already saw someone, uh, I think it was uh, Renata, uh, saying that she's used poll everywhere, Socrative, Kahoot. Uh, these are polling student response systems. Again, when they started years back, they were all for free. Right now, they still have free versions that are enough, but mm, there they're also are so-called, you know, uh, what do you call them, pro or paid, you know, extra features that are very, 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 you know, I mean, very often worth the money, to be honest with you. Okay, then you have the Story Creator for children. It's actually Story Creator is an app for children, and uh, children with the help of parents are really good at creating those, you know, putting up pictures and creating stories, but you can do the same without these tools. Evernote um, is just a fabulous tool, separate slide on it for everything. Again, a free version allows you to use voice and everything in groups or individually across different platforms. So from your phone, jumping onto your laptop, jumping onto your desktop, no problem. And I'm a big treasure hunt queen, okay? So I've done so many treasure hunts and scavenger hunts and all of that. Uh, 
if you do them online, they basically web quests, right? But they still fun. And uh, when you go to any of these tools, they will walk you through the steps, what it takes to create those, right? Um, gosh, these are so many ideas. And now language apps, I actually looked at what's considered best of 2020. Uh, and all of these would have different languages, but not all languages. Again, you have the links to them. I personally used all of them, but the last two for reasons that are obvious. <laughs> and, um, and they're a little bit, you know, it's not like you were going to use these apps to, for, you know, to teach someone language. As language teachers, you know that apps are not going to teach you from A to Z uh, and how to use uh, language in any contextual situa uh, situation, right? But they can give you some phrases, some words, um, games to play and pronunciation and other options. That's what these tools are really good for. Once again, Bubble, Duolingo, um, Lingo, they all, um, uh, Memories, actually pretty good, Buzu and Drops. Um, I have a lot of notes about them included in the slides. Look into the notes of the slides at the bottom once you get the PowerPoint. At the bottom, you're gonna have notes that I took from and that address is also uh, there. It was from CNTA who were um, talking about the best, uh, the uh, the ten best apps of 2020. I kind of went through all of them myself, and as you will see, uh, change the order in the list quite a bit. Uh, okay. Um, so there is a lot of homework. I, I you know I could focus on one uh, and uh, talk only about that, and that would be probably YouTube. <laughs> um, but I decided to show you that many different options and for you to choose what works for you and for your age group. The problem is that I didn't know exactly who I was going to talk to, which is wonderful. Um, wow, this one. So. My youngest son is into learning languages, um, and uh, uh, he was extremely thankful when I said to him that there is an extension in Chrome that actually gives uh, all kinds of subtitles and audio in different languages to movies on Netflix. So you do need a Netflix account, okay? And then you need to be accessing your Netflix from um, Chrome, Google Chrome, which is one of the browsers. And then the extension for language learning that you see, language learning with Netflix extension is free, okay? And it actually works quite well. It, um, yeah. Okay, what it does for you, it gives you an option of, as I said, um, putting onto whatever, let's say it's a movie in Polish and you want to be hearing English audio over it and be reading English subtitles, right? It's all available at once, but it's too much input for your brain, as you know, right? So I don't suggest that. But you could be watching it in Polish and reading English subtitles. So what I'm saying is, um, you know, don't give too much input to the brain. <laughs> it's not going to probably work. But you can watch an English movie and do Polish subtitles. Watch a Polish movie and do English subtitles. Whatever it is, it's a lot for you to play with, right? You don't have to be putting, now there is another thing you can do, you don't have to be putting the extension on. And in order, by the way, to put the extension on, you have to do is click on this language learning with netflix.com um, there and it'll take you from Chrome, right? I'll take you through the steps. Uh, but you can only go into netflix.com and go browse audio, right? And choose your language. And it's going to list all the movies in that language with audio in this language, right? Or you can go browse subtitles and choose the language, okay? And it's going to list the movies that have subtitles in different languages in the language that you've chosen. Huh. 
oh my gosh, it's so weird to be talking about it without doing it, to be honest with you. Um, okay, there is another tool. So are you familiar with Ling? Okay, yeah, I would think so. So again, another um, platform of a gentleman from Vancouver, Canada, if I remember correctly, um, who's done a pretty amazing job at creating tools for language learning, multiple languages, right? But he doesn't give it away for free. He gives some of it for free. <laughs> and that's all you need, okay? So if you go to that website, which is again linked here, right? Um, you can actually, gosh, you can learn so much there. Um, but here's examples of, I could give, take you right now. No, we don't have time. I just looked at the time. Ouch. Okay. Uh, so there is an, a video on YouTube where he actually explains uh, how he can, you could be using the tool that he offers. And that video is mentioned here as well. See the youtube.com one? That's the one. Okay. You know what I'm going to ask next? Have you used Google Translate? You're not going to say you haven't. <laughs> okay. So good. Good. I don't have to speak much uh, there. But so I teach a student from Japan right now in the doctoral program. And he actually, uh, I don't know, he just likes to speak Japanese to me. And I have no idea. I like write Japanese to me. And uh, so I've been using um, I've been using Google Translate a lot lately <laughs> for that purpose, and it gave me some ideas. I mean, for the purpose of understanding what uh, or semi understanding what he's saying to me. And obviously, as you know, Google Translate is not perfect, but it's good for some things, and it's a good starting point. So once again, I've done that with my son, who thinks. He, the youngest, thinks he speaks perfect Polish, and you know the truth, right? Just don't tell him. Um, so sometimes, you know, I would st just type something. I would say to him, like, you know, type it in English, see it in Polish. Is this a good translation, right? And he goes, oh, yeah, no, that sounds really good. Mm -hmm. Not really. Okay, now flip it around. Say it in Polish, as you would say it, and see what English says. And he's like flipping back and forth. He goes, oh, I get it, right? So just manipulating these tools that um, some already know. And then Close Master, you know what close exercises are all about. This is a really good tool for fill in the blank that you can use to create your own fill in the blank exercises um, if that's what you want to do. And use videos, use videos. TED Talks are, again, sub ooh, subtitled in over 100 languages. And people don't know that. So I, you know, there is, they always look for translators, by the way. Um, so what you can do is basically go into TED and do two things. Go into TED and listen to, let's say, English TEDs that are appropriate for your um, learners, right? And put other language subtitles on it. Or you can actually find TEDs in the L1, uh, first language, or heritage language, sorry, right? Um, and again, here I give you links to a couple of I guess, explanations of what can be done. If you haven't heard enough, you can do the same on, in YouTube again, right? I give you here examples. You can have YouTube videos in Polish. You can have YouTube videos about Polish, right? And I would, it would be a fantastic scavenger, not scavenger hunt, a web quest to send your people and say, okay, find uh, videos on YouTube that talk about the Polish Cossacks right or whatever it is that you want to um them to learn about right history or whatever it is or so place um fluent you it's a pretty nice uh platform that is again has free tools and a blog about language learning lots of 
talk, uh, sorry, tools available there and very interesting conversations around language teaching. So that's why I uh, threw it in here. It's free, you can create those lessons. I've done it. Uh, and I'm going to include steps, uh, how to do it in the notes in the PowerPoint, I think they're there. Now, and I told you Quizlet, I'm aware of the time. Um, and I respect it, but uh, I remember we were talking an hour, an hour 30, including questions, right? So I'm stealing a little bit of time from the question time. So yeah, I have a couple of demos how to use Quizlet here. I just typed in a couple of nights ago, Polish flashcards in Quizlet, and that's what I got. Um, this set particular deck has 163 words. Uh, you can click to see a definition. You can uh, click to, you know, hear the pronunciation and all kinds of other, te uh, sorry, games that can be played here, right? So um, basically that's what it is. You can create your own and once again, I never create my own. I always ask students to create them because students learn um, quite a lot when they create things. So um, Quizlet is it, really, really dependable tool. So is Socrative, but now there is less available for free in Socrative, which kind of is a bit upsetting, uh, but it's fantastic for children. So I include it in here. Um, I've, I know that a couple of my colleagues around the world actually have done um, research in um, the usage of Socrative for language learning and were uh, they had pretty good feedback. Um, yeah, so there. Flashcards, we already talked about also, very simple to operate, so good for children, uh, those that um, use computers, right? And uh, I mentioned Evernote, um, you can take notes, capture photos, create to-do lists, record voice, collaborate. Um, so that allows you, that creates a space for you to create, uh, to create uh, an exchange forum for whatever the artifacts uh, there are that you are creating. And scavenger hunt generators, uh, basically I mentioned all three that I've used in the past, but um, I think Hunt, I was kind of disappointed with last time I back I went back to, it could have been just me, but I think it was the price of it. So they've made the tool really bulletproof, but I think the price was prohibitive as far as I'm concerned. I still kept it in here um, because scavenger hunts can be lots of fun, right? In terms of web quests, um, another tool that I wanted to show to you an example of this web quest is in Arabic, so you can, uh, create, uh, click on this example and see how a pretty well designed web, uh, web quest looks. Uh, but you can create all kinds of things um, by asking students to go all over the internet, collect um, artifacts, accumulate them, choose the best, cut and put together into a new artifact. Once again, you probably see that that has been uh, repeating itself a lot. Mm -hmm.